TLC, Usher, Outkast, Tony Braxton were all the people that you were help pushing their careers. Yes. But I was miserable working in the entertainment industry and doing so much in sports. You had all of these very successful, high profile individuals who had everything they'd ever wished for and they were miserable. What people began to realize is peace doesn't cost you the money. Peace allows you to be empowered so that you become a magnet for it. You don't have to lose your soul. Usher, he was upset that you were were leaving. God said, do not work with Usher. He had a major, major thing going on in his life. And he called me and we talked through it. And he said, Welcome to Vault Empowers Talks. So we don't just scratch the surface. We dive deep into the lives of some of the world's most influential people and change makers. And today is no different. I'm your host, Brandi Harvey. But before I introduce my guest for the day, I need you to go ahead and do me a favor. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you do not miss a daily dose of inspiration, motivation, and talks on faith. I'm so excited for this one, y'all. This one's going to be good because I got my sister girl here today. This is the homie. This is the friend, Dr. Sherry Riley. She's an author, a life coach, and an entrepreneur. Sherry began her career as the head of marketing at LaFace Records, where she was pivotal in launching the careers of Usher, TLC, Tony Braxton, and Outkast. As the author of the best-selling book, Exponential Living, Stop Spending 100% of Your Time on 10% of Who You Are, Sherry was nominated for an NAACP Image Award and awarded the best self-help book in 2017. She is a founding partner of John Maxwell's Global Coaching, speaking and teaching team, and serves on John Maxwell's President's Advisory Council. For over 25 years, Sherry has elevated people, brands, and companies through strategic planning, marketing, and partnerships. Sherry, she is a servant leader with a servant's heart and believes that peace is the key to everything. Vault Empowers Talks, welcome wife, mother, entrepreneur, and my super friend, Dr. Sherry Riley to the show. Hey, sis. Hey, girl, what's up? I've been looking forward to this conversation. Listen, <laughs> this, is, have fun. this is the power of being a super friend. Yes. We were talking about this off camera. People don't know. We are in an actual super friends group because yes. we go way back. We you friend know. friends. Yeah, we as been, our friend says, we friends in real life. We friends in real life. We yeah. go back to I think we met in two thousand eight. Yeah, about two thousand eight. Yeah, we met at the salon. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Carly. Yes. Carly. This one, Carly used to have her have her hot combs plugged yes. up. You yes. know, <laughs> sitting under the hair dryer. Sitting under that hair dryer. Listen. Yes. So I am excited for this conversation. For people who don't know, I mean, they see you as an author, they see you as a coach now, but your career really began, you know, in the mind of this 14-year-old girl who had the dreams of going into the music industry. And you found your way in the golden era of music in Atlanta at LaFace Records. Time. Oh, my <laughs> God. When I tell you those moments, I don't think will ever be recreated. Yeah. Like, it literally was that moment in history that lives were changed, but yeah. we are forever bonded. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 22 years ago, right? This was like, what, 22 years ago? Longer than that. Longer than that. It's Long almost 30 years now. Almost 30 years ago. Yeah. You um, were at the yeah. helm of R&B music in Atlanta. TLC, Usher, Outkast, Tony Braxton were all the people that you were help pushing their yes. careers in at that time. the very in that beginning time. of their yeah. careers. When I got to LaFace... Um, TLC, one of the first things that happened, I got hired and uh, LA, they flew me out to a conference out in Seattle. And we sat in his penthouse suite at the top of the hotel um, and he played a video for me, or it was like four of us. And the lights came back on at the end of the video. And it was the second creep video, keyword being second. And the lights came on and he looks at me and he goes, well, what do you think? I just started. What do you mean? What I, I'm not on, I like, I have, like, actually, I hadn't started yet. This was before I started. And I hated the video, mm. but I just got this job, my dream job. I know we'll touch on. So I'm at, and working at LaFace, my dream job. And he asked me, What do you think? And that was the beginning of, Are you going to be an integrity or are you going to say what you think they want to hear? And I had to choose to be an integrity. And I said, I think it's awful. 
And this was the second creep. This is before this, satin pajamas. Yes. This, this is so before they done the... shot one video. Yeah. This was the second video. And I literally gave my assessment. Um, and he said, mm, you're right. And he didn't ask anybody else in the room their opinion and ended up doing a whole nother bid, uh, budget for the creep that we all now see. Wow. That honestly launched that Diamond album, meaning it sold more than 10 million albums. Yeah. That video set the tone for that. Let me tell you, Sherry, I was in seventh grade when Creep came out. <laughs> and when I tell you there was not a moment during a pause in gym class or anywhere, we were not doing that dance. You remember you had to oh, do, yeah. listen, oh, yeah. you had it, right? <laughs> yes. And so those are those moments, those iconic moments. But you were at LaFace, you're living your dream job. And at some point you said, I'm miserable. I literally, people say, why did you resign? I crashed and I burned. And it was something that was always there. Like my very first day. So my first official day. Now this was before I started that story. Um, my first day in the office, my then boss walks me in the office and she says, you have to, um, this young lady, to, to Sean Macon, she's going to be your assistant, and you have to fire her. Hmm. Now, up until this point, to Sean was the only person I'd met. She had been the one who moved me from Cleveland. She was the one who had helped me find my apartment. She was the one that helped me with everything. And so she says, yeah, this is your assistant, and you have to fire her. Again, I had to make the decision. Are you going to give them what they want? Or are you going to be in integrity? So, so why? Why did you have to fire her? Um, I learned much later that was just a part of the industry of you could destroy lives because you could. Did mm. there have to be a reason? Um, what I don't know. Was it a test? Was, I have other than I'm just going to make you do something. And in that moment, I had to again decide integrity because again I'm a small town girl from the Midwest yeah. I'm from Kentucky yeah I, I'm I'm literally this is my dream job I've worked eight years to get this dream job and I'm posed with this moral dilemma because this young lady had no reason to be fired and so in that moment um I didn't know God the way I knew God through this journey um but God dropped in my spirit um to say you know what give me 30 days and I'll I'll move forward with that and I walked out of the office. Here's the reality. She never brought it up again. Hmm. And that young lady ended up being one of the key people ushering me into my relationship with Christ. Wow. Oh, I just got chills. Yeah. She ended up ushering me. It was her, Bishop Long, Joyce Myers, and Yolanda Adams. Tashan was the living manifestation of what God wanted me to be in my walk with him. And if I had fired, so why the enemy had at work and I stood in integrity before I knew God Lord I didn't cherry what in the world I didn't who <laughs> yeah that is so real and so that started so it was a beginning of what caused that moment of of just being in a place and season that I loved what I did I mm. loved working at LaFace. I loved the artists I worked with. We made history. Yeah, absolutely. I love the people that I worked yeah. with. We're still bonded. Yeah. Um, but I was miserable. Yeah. And and I was miserable and, and on the back end of crashing and burning, and I'll share that. But when I crash and I burn, and once I moved to the next phase of my life, what I realized is working at LaFace was only one of my dreams. And a lot of times we're in misery because we stay too long. Yeah. I would have been there 10, 15 years yeah. if I had not crashed and burned. Yeah. And so I learned, like, Sherry, that was one of your dreams. That was one of your dreams. Wow. One of your dreams. That was so one of my dreams. You had the opportunity, and I, I really want you to tell, tell this, because you had opportunity um, to travel all around the world with this dream job. Uh, one of which, you know, you worked very closely with TLC and Lisa Left Eye Lopez. Yes. Now I understand the connection with Rashawn because yes. Rashawn became, Rashawn Ali became Lisa's assistant. assistant. Yes. Well, that's, that's, that's why so I'm like. She knew of me. Yeah. And then Rashawn came to me at an Atlanta Hawks basketball game and said, will you manage me? <laughs> uh, and I'm like, I don't even know you. Yeah. She's like, but I know you. Will you manage me? <laughs> so that boom, there's that whole full circle connection of Rashawn and how Lisa left out Lopez. But you were working with her. Yes. And this was a very pivotal moment. So 
for all those people who grew up and they were watching one of the big hits, Ladies Night. Yes. It was a big hit. You, I mean, you had the heavy hitters. You yes. had Lisa Left Eye. You had Lil' Kim. You had Missy Elliott. Angie all, Martinez. Angie the Martinez. Brat. The Brat. Yeah. Everybody is on, on this song. And y'all go out of the country mm -hmm. to film this video. Well, we're in West Palm Beach. Oh, y'all were in West Palm. We're in West Palm okay. Beach. Okay. Yes. And um, so Lisa... Um, and I'm going to share something about Lisa. Lisa was the most beautiful heart, most creative human being I've ever worked with. Just pure heart. And so she's, at the time, the bigger artist on this song. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. Little Kim's song. Little, yeah. And, um, and so we get to West Palm Beach, and one of the things that made LaFay so amazing and so groundbreaking is th the way we developed our artists. And you don't leave your artists. Like, everything about our artists was you there, you develop, you're present. And so we get on set, and what should have been a one-day video was three days. Mm. Um, any and everything that should and should not happen um, was happening on this video set. <laughs> um, the director at one point left to go drive cars and we're just sitting, what are we doing? <laughs> N half the people in the video were not originally in the video, but this became a party and people were flying in for the video and they were like, oh, you can be in it, you can be in it, you can. They weren't even supposed to be in the video. It, there's certain things I won't say, but imagine everything that's going on in this video. And so, and then there was this tension because Lisa's the bigger artist, but this was Little Kim's video. And then you add the fact that Lisa brought 20 of her closest friends to be in the video that no one knew about. So we're trying to navigate that. So all of this is going on. And at about three in the morning, I'm sitting and two of the extras who had on bikinis start fighting. They rip each other's bikinis off. No one stops them. Oh, my God. And I'm sitting there next to Jamie Foster Brown, who owns Sister to Sister, and another writer, Karen Good. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't do this anymore. Mm. I can't do this anymore. And I, I called um, to Sean, and we prayed. And I called another girlfriend, and I literally got up the next morning to leave the video shoot. Now, there was another day. And one of the things you don't do is you never leave your artist Ella face. And when I went to Lisa, I said, Lisa, I'm leaving. I'm going home. And I got on the plane, um, and this is before 9-11. So we had to connect in Atlanta, and I was going to go to Usher's video shoot for You Make Me Wanna. Mm. And so we connect in Atlanta. I'm in first class, and Jermaine ends up behind me because he's flying to the video shoot. And I'm in first class. We leave West Palm Beach. We land in Atlanta. We connect to go to L.A. And Brandy, all I remember is when my eyes opened, I saw the flight attendants, I saw other people, and I could see the worry in their faces. And I heard them say, oh, she's awake, she's awake. And the entire plane had emptied. And I didn't know, the entire plane. Wow. I got off the plane, I went to Tashawn's apartment. She lived in LA. I laid on her floor. I knew I, I couldn't get up. Wow. I called my boss at the time. I said, I can't make Usher's video shoot. So that's two times I haven't showed up for an artist. And I got on the red eye that night. I came back home. I laid on my floor in my apartment for five days. Wow. In the dark. God was just ministering to me and talking to me. I was at New Birth at the time. I went to Wednesday night service and I cried through the entire service. And there was a lady sitting next to me. I never said anything. But you know that wallowing, weeping cry yeah. when God, the Holy Spirit is truly ministering to you. And I wallowed and I cried, I cried and I wallowed. And at the end of it, she said, God told me to send you a book. I have this book to this day. She mailed me the book. Well, overnight, I got the book the next day. And inside, the whole time I was in service that Wednesday night, God kept saying to me, the face is your Egypt. And I'm going to take you into your promised land. And your promised land is serving people. And your promised land is exponential living. And he gave me exponential living. And he told me 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 21 is your mission. Everything you do, your company, everything you do will be 1 Timothy 6, uh, 1 Timothy 6 uh, 17 through 21. And I got up. She sent me the book. She wrote in the book, God has called you out of Egypt. We never talked. Wow. 
She said, in the writing, I have it to this day, she said, God called you out of Egypt to use you into his promised land. I literally, I read that. I called, I called uh, L.A., and I said, L.A., I'm going to resign. I was walking around Home Depot. I said, L.A., I'm going to resign. And he said, I knew one day you would. I wow. called Kenny, babyface. I said, Kenny, I'm going to resign. And he said, I think that's the best thing for you. Wow. But here's the thing, back to the integrity. I knew ushers, I knew you make me want it was going to be his breakthrough hit. I wouldn't leave until I did the right thing by his album. So I set his album up, and then that's when I resigned. Who, <laughs> Sherry, I wasn't expecting all these chills I was getting. And that don't happen very often with me. Yeah. When I tell you, wow. Yeah, and I took 10 months, and I did nothing. I did nothing. I went and visited my family. And when I knew that the path to my purpose was being unveiled is when I went to home, my hometown in Richmond, Kentucky, and my aunt said, oh, my God, it's so good to see your eyes. I was like, see my eyes. She was like, yeah, Sherry, every time you come home, pager. She's like, you're always looking at that little thing in your hand, and you go from that to the phone. And even though you've been home, I haven't seen your eyes. Mm. Right? Wow. And so that's when God gave me the difference between our presence and being present. Yeah. Right? Because my presence was there, but I hadn't been present. Wow. Wow. So you get this download of exponential living years before the book years I mean this is like I had to go 12 years yeah of writing that book wow so God gave me exponential living he gave me that it's nine principles and he gave me uh stop spending 100 percent of your time on 10 percent of who you are and nothing else that was it that was it he said take this and run and I did 12 years of uncovering what that really was to produce that book Oh, yeah. Sherry, that is so good because I even when I was in pre-production, we were talking I, and I told the team, I was like, one thing about Sherry, Sherry is solid, Thank you. solid through and through. Anybody ask me who's solid, who Sherry Riley is 100 percent solid. Her relationships are solid. She does not burn bridges. Mm -hmm. She keeps her word. She stands true. Ten toes down. That is her. And that is such a testament because even now. Right. Fast forward all those years later, Usher, who you didn't let, he was upset that you were leaving him yes. at this at this <laughs> part, a part of his career. He was upset. Very. Yeah. Yeah. He and and when I shared with him, so I told Ken LA, I told Kenny, and then I knew I had to tell him. I called his mother first. And then uh, I took him, we were in the office, I took him into the hallway of the office, and I was like, you know, um, you know time for me to start my own company and he jumps up and he's like yes oh my god yes now you can work with me exclusively <laughs> right and I was just like no yeah I, I can't work with you and what I knew at the time is God was saying to me he needs your friendship more than he'll ever need your marketing expertise mm. but I was starting a company <laughs> and the best client is the client that's already established yeah. that you are and I had to be obedient again, that again, mm. back to that integrity, right? And I had to be obedient and trust God at launching a business, but not launching with someone who literally every other week was like, you ready to work with me now? You ready to work with yeah. me now? To the point where he thought, okay, if it's not marketing, it must be running my foundation. Yeah. And so one day he called me and he was just like, um, okay, I got what you can do now because I know you don't want to do the music industry stuff, in, uh, industry stuff, you can run my foundation. And I was like, well, maybe that's what God wanted me to do because that's from my heart. That's integrity. I can do that. Let me. Yeah. So I went and got certified through the VIP, YMCA VIP yeah, program. I, 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 got, I did that too. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I got yeah. certified. And uh, after I got certified, God said, I didn't say any of that. I said, do not work with Usher. And I had to then go back to him again wow. and say, I can't work with you. And fast forward, it was probably 10, 12 years later. Um, he had a major, major thing going on in his life. And he called me and we talked through it. And he said, now I understand. Now I understand why you never work with me. And I love you even more for it because I understand the sacrifice of that. But it's because of this. I have nowhere else to go yeah. to generally have this type of conversation about who I am. Yeah. 
And it's because I know you're my friend. I know you love me. Because I'd always say to him, I'm more concerned with you, the man, than you, the brand. The brand. Right? Yeah. And so it took 10 or 12 years, but he finally grew into the understanding. But that was, again, that rooted in, Sherry, are you going to go after the money? Are you going to go after the integrity? And I don't want to sound like, oh, my God, it's been peaches and cream. That was a lot of sacrifice. Yeah. That was a lot of financial sacrifice. Um, but what God has given me has been greater than money. Yeah. And, the, and you can always make money. Yeah. You'll never be able to get your name in, at the level of integrity. Like you said, when you say solid. Yeah. That. Yeah. That right there. Yeah. You Ten can't toes buy down. That. I'll bet on you anytime. Yeah. Because I know that. And I mean, and here's the testament. You told Usher that you didn't, you couldn't work with him, that it wasn't what you were supposed to do, what you were called to do. Fast forward a few months ago at his Las Vegas residency, he's on stage and he sends you the most heartfelt message from the stage. I was so, sh I did not know that the, was The look on your face in the video <laughs> showed me. I was like, <laughs> Sherry was like... I did Did you not just sit here in front of all these people? <laughs> like, you know, you could have called me, right? You know, but he said, you know, you gave him strength when he didn't have strength for himself. Yeah. And he said that he will always cherish you. Yeah. Yeah. And the relationship. And, and when I say brother, sister, like when we say heart and soul, it really is. And money could have never bought that. Yeah. Um, and, and the thing is, but it's real. Because when he was 15 and I was this young executive, when I first started at LaFace, I'm not that, I'm a few old, year, years older than him, but not that much, um, in the sense of I was just a small town girl from Kentucky with a dream. Yeah. So I didn't know, I was so green, I didn't know the industry politics. All I knew is that I'm, as I'm in this position and this young man has a dream. Every artist I ever worked with, and even my clients to this day, my responsibility is their dream yeah. because I had a dream. That's what brought me here. And so what, you know, people thought was, you know, this quote unquote agenda of, you know, building this relationship. No, I just had a dream. He had a dream. And all those days at Houston's and at his house and what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? Um, I genuinely love him as a person. Yeah. Right. But that's the thing. I love you as a person. Yeah. Like, I love people. Like, really love people. And it's never been attached to who and what they are. And because of that, people feel this genuineness that, honestly, a lot of people don't believe. As much as you say I'm solid, one person told me one day, you're very polarizing because a lot of people don't like that about me. And even the funny thing with Janetta, so go back to Usher. I mean, he was 14. I was responsible for this kid. And I would, you know, I spent every Thanksgiving at the home, at, home, at his house with wow. Janetta and his brother. We spent Christmas, like, because I didn't go home a lot. And so this was my family, like, still my family. Ten years later, Janetta says to me, and Janetta's his mom, she said, you really are who you say you are. Hmm. And I was like, huh? She was like, oh, Sherry, I've been waiting. Like, I've been waiting to see the real. She was like, but... You really, like, you really are this person. Yeah. And I just busted out laughing. I said, it took you 10 years. <laughs> but she's like, you know, this industry is full of people oh, who look listen. the part. Yeah. She's like, but you genuinely, and that was such a moment. We laugh about it, but that was 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> listen, because most people, I mean, and we can, of course, that was some time ago that she says this, but even we look at, the way social media is and how people are not who they post to be. Y'all know it. Amen. You ain't who you post to be. <laughs> it's always a different version. Like, oh, that's what you really look like in person? Yeah. That's who you really are? You really, these scriptures you got on this, like, you really not that, huh? Like, you really live that. <laughs> and I get that from people who, like, you intimately know me, yeah. right? But I'll get that from people when they, now with social media, they've heard about me and they meet me and they go, oh, you really are that person. Yeah. Like, no, that's really me. But it is polarizing for some people. And my husband said it best. He's like, baby, people don't like the fact that you're a mirror. Mm. <laughs> like, they don't want to see themselves and you don't even realize it. Because, you know, it really hurt me for many years because I'm like, I'm just being who I am. He's like, exactly. Yeah. And I had to really mature and grow into being okay with the people who could not handle or did not like 
that part of my truth. Yeah. Being a mirror for their truth. Being a mirror for their truth. Being a mirror for their truth. That takes a lot of clarity. That takes a lot of self-reflection, a lot of self-awareness, and a real journey to peace. Yes. To get there. And you chose peace over the Birkin bag. So did. Yeah, you chose so it. Did. You chose the peace. Girl. Yeah, and this has not been an easy road to get here. Ooh. And so really talk about this journey because you leave LaFace, you uproot, you resign on June 5th, you close on your house June 6th. <laughs> Yo. Your daddy is like, what is wrong with you? That part. Have you lost your mind? He literally went to my cousins and said she's had a nervous <laughs> Like, I need y'all to go check on her. Yeah. yeah. And my last day at LaFace was June 19th, and that's the day I moved into my house. Yeah. And I left my vested money for my 401k. I would have been vested in six weeks. Wow. But obedient, God, that's when he told me to leave. Now, to this day, I'd be like, God, we couldn't have got the rest of that we money. We could have just gone we six more weeks. Six more weeks. Six more weeks. But I understand now, uh, I am not going to cry. I understand now. That was the, not the test, but that was the place of, are you really going to be about this piece? Yeah. Because it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. Are you going to get that money in six weeks? And I really learned in that moment, peace does not buy happiness. Yeah. You know, people say peace will delay it or I'm going to be, yeah, but at what cost? And I'm happy and I'm at peace. Yeah. But the peace has to come first. Yeah. The peace has to come first. And so the journey to it, um, I, then God released peace, clarity, and courage, which came out of that First Timothy 6, uh, 17 through 21. And what I found is that working in the entertainment industry and doing so much in sports is that you had all of these very successful, high-profile individuals who had everything they'd ever wished for, everything they'd ever wanted, everything they'd ever dreamed about, and they were miserable, Yeah, just like I was. I was just dumb enough, stupid enough to tell it. And honestly, when I first started saying, you know, peace is the new success, my friends and colleagues was like, girl, ain't nobody kumbaya in no corner. <laughs> like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Like, I'm going to get yeah. that Birkin bag. Yeah. Um, and all of them, I eventually have become clients. Mm. And I started living this journey of peace. And I still had the purse. I still had the home. I've owned eight homes in my lifetime. Yeah. I still had the home. I still had the external things. But I started getting the... Okay, girl, what you doing? Yeah. Because there's something about you that's different. It's different. And what people begin to realize is peace doesn't cost you the money. Peace allows you to be empowered so that you become a magnet for it. Mm. And you don't have to hustle and grind. You don't have to lose your soul. Mm. That in and of itself a preach, right? <sighs> um, but it also allowed you to understand the power in it. Like I now understand money's power has nothing to do with what it can buy me. It's how it empowers me to support others as well as myself. Yeah. And I still, and I can still go buy the shoes and the bag. Listen, <laughs> and still keep your child in and private school. And still keep my baby and, in and, private school. And all the things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've had to, in, in the midst of all that, I've been homeless. Yeah. After the success of LaFace, after mm. the success of my business, mm. I then had that season where God had to then take me to a higher level of what does that look like? Because when you sat in the presence of some of the most important, powerful people in the world, you sit in the presence of people who have more money than you could ever think about making. You sit in the presence of people who have brands and, and name recognition globally that yeah. impacts nations, and you're homeless, and nobody knows. How, how did it and happen? nobody knows. How did it happen? Um, it was a season of my dad passed. Um, then me and my husband hit a very tough spot in our marriage. Um, the company was transitioning from what we had traditionally done. And I was transitioning into this space as an empowerment speaker, high performance life coach. Um, those were the external things internally, uh, what I learned. So I literally ended up in Shanti Das, my good mm, friend Shanti Das. We love Shanti. I ended up, ended up yeah. in her spare bedroom. So me and Dominique was in her spare bedroom. My husband and, and my oldest daughter, my bonus daughter, went back and lived with his mom and his dad. So you all separated for mm -hmm. a time. Yep. And so in Shanti's spare bedroom, I'm in prayer and worship. Like I'm praying, I'm worshiping. And Shanti, about four months in, she said, what? Because she grew up Catholic. So she said, what are you doing in there? And I was like, I'm 
praying and I'm worshiping. She's like, no, what is that? Because she grew up Catholic. And, and by the way, you would <laughs> never know this by Shanti Das right now. Absolutely Just not. fast forward. Yes. Okay. And so I began to share with her what it was. And so I taught her how to pray. I was in her home. Wow. And so I taught her how to pray. I taught her how to worship. And she eventually, you know, she's at Ebenezer and, and yeah. a powerful woman of faith. And so the reality is this. What I thought was that I was homeless, I was on assignment. I was on assignment. Oh my God. Yeah. Sherry. <laughs> why, why are you doing this to me, Sherry? Listen, yeah. you was on an assignment. I was on assignment. Yes. I was you on assignment. Because when you look at what Shanti, the impact and the lives that Shanti has And for people saved, who do not know, Shanti Das was in the golden era with you at yes. LaFace. Yeah. I mean, the, all the careers, you all were working together at yep. the same time. I helped negotiate her first contract when she moved to New York. And the thing is, she was a part of my exponential living birthing before I knew it as well. Because now she is Silence to Shame, Silence the to focus shame. on mental health. Yep. And, and Mebo, which is Mind and Body and Health, uh, her platform. But in that journey, um, she was one of those, and she don't mind me saying this, but she was one of those who was like, girl, what are you doing? Like, yeah. you understand this money we can get? Yeah. Um, but, but being there for her prior to that moment of living with her, I was just always there. Like she'll say, you was a mentor and a coach before I knew what a mentor and a coach was or that I needed it. But again, I love people and I was just always there. And so during this journey of being there for her as her mentor, her friend, her, then her coach, then living in her home, then the spiritual growth that we had together, I was on assignment. And from that, um, we were sitting at a table one day and she had wrote a book and she was like, I just want to get my book into the bookstore in the airport. And I said, Shanti, you're thinking too small. You're sitting on a movement. And Silence of Shame was birthed out of that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I was on assignment. You were on an assignment. I was on assignment. You were on assignment. <laughs> yeah. And and this is, I've never known this about you. I know. Because this was happening <laughs> when we were friends. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing was, God told me to um, not say anything. And the reason was not because he wanted me to hide, but because the timing. Yeah. Because again, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 21 talks about commanding those who are wealthy not to be arrogant and put their hope in riches, but put their hope in, in, in God. Command them to be willing to share and do great things, right? And so in order to command someone, they have to respect you. But the other side of that is God was like, I need you to sit in these seats where people have all of this wealth and influence and access and you have, quote unquote, nothing. nothing. But they, you're sitting there because they're coming to you for something yeah. that they don't have. And if they knew you were homeless, they would think that the message was out of your brokenness, right? Or they wouldn't respect the message. But if they understand, if they see you as their equal, and then later learn, hold on, she helped me make $10 million and she was broke? Yeah. She was homeless? She was struggling? I even started my first mastermind with 12 individuals. I would sit in the library parking lot crying from embarrassment, and no one knew that this had become my journey. But it was in my brokenness that God birthed exponential living. Mm. It was in my brokenness that he, because how can I speak to people now the way I do, the clients that I coach, and say peace is the core of what you need and they are multimillionaires on their way to billionaires have all of these things if i haven't lived through that truth yeah like my biggest thing and i said this to god god all i ever want to do is represent your truth mm. i didn't know what i was asking for <laughs> but going through that journey i look back on it now and go wow god wow wow i mean i am literally i am this is so good because you you say it all the time that everybody has to come to a point when they make a decision. Yes. They have to make the decision, they have to give themselves permission, and they have to figure out what they're willing to give up in order to go up. Yeah. Everybody has to come to that. Everybody, over and over and over. And so the first part is when you have to make a decision. Because so many people, you ask them, you know, what do you want to do? I don't know. Or you ask, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, you know, I want to build this, that, and the third, and I'm going to do this, but girl, I don't know. 
Well, behind that I don't know is, is you, you cut off what you do know. And so my thing is give yourself, the first thing you got to do is make a decision to stop saying I don't know yeah. and focus on what you do know. And then when you stop saying I don't know, you then got to give yourself permission, dot, dot, dot. Get, give yourself permission to get help. Give yourself to a permission to admit your vulnerabilities. Yeah. Give yourself permission to be okay with yeah. the fact that you do know this, but you don't know everything. Yeah. And then John Maxwell, I got that from him. Then you got to decide what are you going to give up to go up? Um, because in every decision and whenever you give yourself permission, there's a part of you you've grown past that you've either too afraid to let go of. It's a habit. So you don't know how to get out of reframing the habit or someone told you that's who you are before you knew who you were. Mm. Right. And so you now have to decide what will you give up to go up? Wow. And it's a continual season. I'm in the next level of it now. Yeah. Yeah. I've had to decide I will give up. There's an area of lack of confidence that I grew out of in 2023. An area of lack of confidence. Yes. Because I've said been 20... driven, but I wasn't, I was driven, but I wasn't confident. Because you said 2023 was your year of rehab. Absolutely. And 2024 is your year to race and dominate. Man, to go get it. Yeah. So 2023, that year of rehab, meaning, you know, I'm, I had surgery on my foot. Listen, y'all wouldn't know, <laughs> by the way, she <laughs> high stepping in these shoes today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I had surgery on my foot. And so I had to start rehab. And so the foot was fine but there were some things about it that wasn't working properly, right? And so when I went through the surgery, the rehab is now showing me how to use it effectively and properly. And so my year of rehab was things were great, but there were some things about me that just wasn't working properly. And a part of that was my level of confidence um, in where I needed to go next. And so that stemmed from, there was just a part of me that I wasn't allowing to show up, hmm. right? And so the rehab, <laughs> I thought that meant there was this internal work I had to do. Yeah. Sis, the year of rehab was people for me. Mm. People and relationships. How? So there were relationships in my life that were out of order. There was relationships that were out of order, meaning when you have friendship, friendship is always supposed to be reciprocal but it's never going to be equal. Yeah. And when you expect equal, like equalness in the friendship, uh, it's always going to be off. I wasn't even receiving reciprocity. Oh yeah, because we <laughs> talked about this. Yes. Yeah. I wasn't you, even we receiving talked about reciprocity. This. Yeah. And so, meaning, I didn't even create space for people to give to me, and it was because of areas of my confidence because I didn't feel worthy. Hmm. I didn't feel worthy, and I didn't feel worthy because of situations that happened to me when I was 15 years old. There was a brokenness in me that happened at 15 that I had healed from, but I wasn't whole in. And so what happens when you go through rehab? You have to go through the healing and you gotta get whole. And so I went through this rehab of every relationship in my life. Every, I mean, my mother, mm. my husband, my two daughters, but the most important rehab relationship was with myself. Yeah. Why do you not feel worthy of receiving? Right. Yeah. And then, you know what I told you, what 2024, God said, what? God said, you pray big, you believe big, but you receive, receive small. big. Listen, but you're going to receive big this one. <laughs> I'm going to receive big. That was the core because I pray big. I receive, I pray big. I believe big, but I receive small. Well, why did I receive small? It went back to that, that worthiness that showed up in this area of confidence. And so all of that in 2023 had to get made whole, yeah. not just healed. Yeah. It had to get whole. Sherry, listen, because when we, Sherry, you dropped this at the Super Friends brunch. And I mean, literally, I told you, I pulled out my notes. I said... Um, I'm, this is going to be on a winning Wednesday. I just want you to know. I'm going <laughs> to yeah. credit you. This will be on a winning Wednesday. But I'm going to let you know right now that this this uh, praying big and receiving, uh, believing big, and this season you're going to receive big. receive big. 
Like I literally, that was the the runaway message from when the last time you and I were together. Yes. And I have been saying it every single. I literally quoted you in an interview that I just did. I was like, and Sherry Riley said, "Oh, we know Sherry Riley." Uh huh. <laughs> Sherry Riley said, "Then this is what I'm believing." Yeah. For the season, because so many of us don't realize mm -hmm. that we are praying to God, we are asking God for these big things, and yet when they're presented, we are receiving small. Yeah. I don't. I don't. Well, why you do it like I didn't? They didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Think. Or he'll give us a piece of it, and we'll go, "Oh, that's it," and not allow ourselves to be open to the fullness of what that really is. Yeah. Right. Meaning, let's say you're believing. You know, you're a speaker, and you're believing for a big payday, right, to speak, and you you get this big payday, this five figure speaking engagement. You go, "Yes, I got it." Well, the reality is, is that the totality? of what you were supposed to receive? Mm. Or is that the first part of it, right? Because the children of Israel, right, they got to the Red Sea, they was ready to turn, turn back. Turn back, yeah. Because for them, they got free, but that wasn't the totality of what God had for them. But in order to receive big, they literally had to uh, walk through the Red Sea, yeah. right? And so what happens is we get to the beginning of it and then it overwhelms us. And we got to believe at that next level of what God has for us yeah. at that next level, yeah. right? I, I believe for a husband, you get married, but are you believing for the marriage that you really want, Yeah. right? Yeah. And so this year, um, it really, and it, man, what are we, 25 days in? Yeah. When I tell you God is showing up and showing out, yeah. but I had to be prepared. Yeah. I had to get prepared for all that he really wants to pour into my life, my business, my daughters, my children, my family everything. What does the preparation look like? Because there are some people who are like, well, I don't even know where to start on this journey to peace and clarity, Chad. I ain't got no courage. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm still trying to go ask the wizard. Okay. Yeah. yeah. For the courage. Yeah. So what do you do? What do you tell somebody who's like taking that first step? Uh, the first step is the stop saying, I don't know. Uh, the second step is removing the butts. Ooh, that's yeah. it. Come on. You, we, we, the butts. My, our wife, my own girl. Yeah. Because you said when you, you say the butt, yeah, so, you remove and, God. Now, I'm a woman of faith. I don't put my faith on anyone, but I, and I speak in the marketplace, but I got to start with the Bible on this one. And, you know, Jesus had went out, and there was a story where he was healing. He brought Lazarus from the dead. He's healing the blind. Like, Jesus is out here doing it, right? Yeah. And it said he came home. And when he got home, everybody ran out like, oh, my God, this is Jesus. He's doing this. He's doing this miracle. He's healed this person. He brought this person from the dead. But isn't that Mary and Joseph's son? Mm -hmm. But isn't, our, he's just a carpenter, right? And so here you are in the presence of God. And everything behind that but removed the blessing. Mm. Because you went from him being the miracle worker to him just being a carpenter. He ain't really like that, is like, he? But, but ain't he just, so when we talk, if you really catch yourself, and I want all your audience, really catch yourself every time you say but, there's something behind the but that's eliminating everything you had in front of the butt. Yeah. You know, I want to be a doctor, but loss, uh, but a medical school is too expensive. I know I can do this, but, right? And so we have to stop saying I don't know, and then we got to stop saying but. And in that but, we got to just focus on the first thing we say, right? And so if you are a person of faith, Ephesians 2.14 says he is our peace, meaning Jesus is our peace. So we do have to give our life to living and loving and learning the word. If you're not a person of faith, right, you have to find in you that inner place of calm that allows you to tap into that inner voice. Yeah. I believe that voice is the Holy Spirit. But you tap into that same place. You get to enjoy the power of peace when you allow yourself to really go into that place of who am I? Yeah. Who am I? And so it starts with stop saying I don't know. Yeah. Eliminate the buts. Yeah. And give yourself permission to truly walk into that inner place of who you are. Yeah. Because if you ask a very successful person this question, oh, 90 percent of them freeze. And that question is, who are you? Hmm. 90% of them do not have an answer. They're going to give me their resume. They're going to give me their degrees. They're going to give me their civic uh, impact. They're going to tell me the awards they've won. But who are you? That's the question. That's where the peace really lies. Yeah. And why do you feel like most people can't answer that question? Um, 
because of the fear of the answer. Because mm. so many of us are living in a life that really isn't integral with who we are. Um, or we have to deal with the, the, the pain of things that we've compartmentalized. Or we just honestly don't want to know. Because if I have to know who I really am, then I've got to really align some truths in my life that I really don't want to do. And so that's why I only work with the ready, willing, and committed. Because you really mm. do have to be able to answer the question, who am I and what do I want? Yeah. Who am I and what do I want? And so 90% of the time, we don't want to answer that question just out of fear of what the answer will be. But when you have the courage to really work on yourself to answer that question, you'll always find it's better on the other side. Yeah. Always. You said most people, they find faults, right? Yes. They got to get over themselves. And part of that, what I'm hearing is that's the getting over yourself, mm -hmm. you know, because most of us, oh, I don't want to deal with her because she's too this. Oh, I can't deal with they. they oh, they don't, I don't like them over there because our fear is where we find the fault. Yes. Yeah. And when we find the fault, um, if we choose to do that in a work, eventually we have to then go from fault to value. Mm. Right. And so 2023, a part of my rehab was instead of spending so much time on my vices, I committed to focusing on my value. OK. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Go back. Wait. Yeah. What? What? How, what huh? Because when you're driven, drive says I got to fix this to go to the next level. I got to yeah. take this class. Yeah. I got to take this certification. I got to work on this. Yeah. I got to read this. Book. I got to change. This. So you're constantly working on your vices when you're driven. When you are focusing on your confidence, you're focusing on your value, right? I'm worthy of this. Am I perfect? No, but I don't have to be. Mm. Okay, what is my value? My value is I truly listen. My value is I'm solid. My value is I'm focused on integrity. So I can lean into my value so I can grow in my confidence. It doesn't mean I overlook my vices, yeah. but it begins to equal out how much energy are you putting on getting better at your vices or how much energy are you getting better and how you are valued for yourself? And when I began that process of really learning how to focus on my values and I grew in my confidence, guess what? I wasn't so easily trapped in my vices. Mm. So if my vices, I don't really like I'll over talk people. That was one of my vices because I, I got to get this out. Well, when I learned to grow in my value, it taught me to listen with intent mm. even more. So I didn't have to focus on over talking people because now my value is I'm going to listen yeah. because whatever you say doesn't minimize who I am. Mm. Right. And so when we focus on our values, not our arrogance, there's a difference. Right. Because people be like, oh, yeah, I'm the bomb. I'm the this. Is that what you're saying or is that what you believe? Mm. Right. And so when you really focus on your value, it really does make you more humble to how you show up. Ooh, humble to how you show up. Yeah. Now the thing about humility, though, Sherry, because because we've all had some humbling moments mm -hmm. on on our journeys, right? And you uh, you did a IG live uh, not too long ago, and you talked about the no's that got you to the yes. That there's been a whole lot of no's that got you to that yes. And there was a particular year, your first year in business, you made fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. And she said, you know, well, you know, that really mean you brought home like 15. Pretty much. And, you know. <laughs> That's why you end up homeless. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can't survive. Yeah. Off of these, wa these minimum wages. Yeah. It's minimum. Yes. <laughs> these wages. You see, it's all tied together, yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. And so now you're like, I got all those no's, you know, a first year of $50,000. And now I have conversations for 30 minutes and I'm making $50,000. Yeah. And the, the, the painful part of the no's, it, it was from the people that I, I had poured so much into or been there for that I automatically assume would be a yes. Mm. Don't we do that? Oh, my god. We goodness. think that these the ones. This is my hitter. They're going to yeah. show up. They got me. And, and so what I didn't share in that, that, that reel was the no's came, the pain in the no's came from the people that I truly believe would be a yes. I never expected a no. And so, but what I learned was the power in the nose allowed me to one, not depend on something that was undependable. 
because they could only say yes so many times. So if they had said yes in that moment, I would not have developed and grown and built yeah. what I built yeah. that was sustainable yeah. because of that no. Yeah. Um, there was also some no's that honestly, um, what the cost of the yes would have been too great. Mm. And I didn't see that at the time. Yeah. Um, but I always said, even when I was in Kentucky trying to get into the entertainment industry, I would always say to myself at a young age, it doesn't matter how many no's I get, I only need one yes. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many no's I get, I only need one yes. And so the one yes, the one yes overrides all the no's. But the lessons you get from the no's, yeah. the maturity you get from the no's, the growth you get from the no's. But here's the big piece. The people that the no's removed was the gateway for the people that the no's brought to my life that really were in this next season. Yeah. Right. And if I hadn't gotten the no's, I wouldn't have been open to the gateway for the people that have come into my life that I needed that yeah. were more integral in yeah. that part of my journey. Yeah. Um, and honestly understood the reciprocity of what yes was. Yeah. That's, that's and, big though. And can I add this to that? Yeah. And the no's really taught me um, to step out of my, what I call my false humility. See, I've always prided myself on being humble, especially coming through the music industry and all the arrogance that comes from that. But what I realized, Brandy, I wasn't humble, I was hiding. Mm. Yeah, I wasn't humble, I was hiding. And so those no's forced me to stop hiding mm. because I had to step outside of their no to be more of what I was called to be. And I, oh, you're not humble, girl. You hiding. Ooh. Yeah. That's a word for some people because so many people, whether young, old, doesn't matter where they are on the spectrum, they feel like, well, I'm just being humble and I don't want the spotlight and I don't need to be out front. And that's for somebody else to do. And that's not really what I like to do. And that's not my scene. But often, it's really not us being humble. We're hiding. We're hiding. We're hiding right. behind a mask. We're hiding behind a veil. We're hiding in the shadows. We're hiding behind our insecurities. Yes. Yeah. And, and, all, and that was, again, that year of rehab, that area of confidence. And it's hard when you have been very successful to understand that you're not confident, right? Mm. Because drive and, com and confidence, they seem so equal. But the truth of the matter is drive is what pushes us to achieve. Confidence is who we are when we get there, mm. right? Yeah. That's why you have these successful people that you look at them and you're like, what? You, huh? What yeah. But they're driven. They're not successful. And so we expect because you're the CEO that you're confident enough in who you are as a person. Yeah. And that's not true. And that's why I love the work I do focus on high performers is because you got to create a safe space to be able to understand what it takes to be confident. Yeah. And it's that inner work. Yeah. It's, it's really tapping into that peace, that clarity and that courage. So what's the one thing that high performers can do to help build their confidence? Ooh, um, I would say if I had to make a universal answer, um, it really is starting with gratitude mm -hmm. because we're always on to the next and then to the next and to the next. And we may say our prayers and we may say thank you, but there's a difference between being, ha being um, happy that something happened or grateful or having this gratitude that something happened and truly owning that I am grateful. Because when you truly own I am grateful, it allows you to understand, wow, I can appreciate this and still want more. Mm -hmm. And you know, we were talking yeah. earlier, I was uh, yeah. talking with your amazing EP for this show. Um, and we were talking <laughs> you about- You just gave her a title she did not know she had, <laughs> child. She is over here. She trying to leave us next week. Don't worry, save her for myself. And so we were talking about our pastor, <laughs> Pastor Darius Daniels, and, you know, saying that you can be grateful and still want more. And what happens is we feel like when you're really driven, you feel like if you ever feel accomplished, if you ever feel like I've made it, if you ever feel like that you'll lose this edge or this drive, that I want to get more. And so it really starts with high performers, me really tapping into their, their ability to feel grateful and what that unlocks is those insecurities. Mm, what if I yeah. don't, what, I don't ever want to be broke again. I want to make my mother proud. I, all of those Those things, are like the top, the anxiety, those are the top ones. Yeah. Oh, the anxiety yeah. of performing, yeah. right? If I, that 
anger. Oh, I have so many, especially my male clients, that, that their anger drives them, especially black men, right? Because they got to go out and be armed every day. And so they feel like if they really own that gratitude, it, they'll lose that edge, that anger. Mm. When the reality is it's peace really is the power. So when we remove that anger, when we work with their mindset, I put my clients on a 21-day peace and a positive mind challenge, right? Where I really have them every time they say, I don't know. Every time they have a negative thought, they have to first acknowledge the thought, arrest the thought, and replace the thought. Mm. And what happens is they realize, oh, my God, I'm such a negative thinker. My yeah. mindset is yeah. so rooted in negativity because they have to do that all day. And so that's the first step. That's always the first step. We got to reframe that thinking to even open them up to the power of peace. Yeah. So reframing your thinking is what got you out of Shanti's bedroom. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What was that first thing that you had to do? The first, ooh, <clears throat> get myself up off the bathroom floor. Yeah. <laughs> out yeah. of those wallowing and those tears. Um, the first thing I had to do is um, remove the embarrassment. I had to remove the embarrassment. Because how could you have done all the right things? Yeah. How could you have made all the right decisions? How could you have run a multi-million dollar business? How could you have all these relationships and contacts? How could you have all of this yeah. and be in someone's spare bedroom? And, yeah. and when she had friends come over, family, fr family and friends come from out of town in a hotel with your six, seven-year-old daughter, how could you have gotten here? And so I had to release myself from the embarrassment. And in releasing myself from the embarrassment, I had to then ask myself the question, you know, what do you want? And the truth of the matter is I didn't want what was making me money up to that point. I didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't want to have my successful marketing firm. I didn't want to do strategic partnerships. I didn't want to do that. Um, but I had to then be open to then what do you want? And I had to start all over. The work I'm doing now, I'd never heard of personal professional development. I didn't come through the HR world and the yeah, girl, we didn't yeah. have HR at, at LaFace. We, <laughs> we, did, we, we didn't had, have it at Steve Harvey yeah, World Group back we, in the day. Right. We got it now. We got it now, God. right? <laughs> but we didn't have that, right? I didn't know about a John Maxwell. I yeah. didn't know these things. And so I went on this new journey of trusting something I didn't know about. And with high performers, a lot of times in that transition, you have to start with, I, what do you want? Because it usually uncovers something you may not know. Yeah. And in that starting over, I had to really recognize, you know, you're not starting over from here, Sherry. You're starting over from here. That's a different starting point. But we feel like we're starting from the bottom, where your bottom is really at the mountaintop. Yeah. Your bottom, that's why yeah. God says glory to glory. Um, and so in that place of recognizing I'm starting over, when I tell you, I never understood my aunties. I never understood my grandmother when they would say I wouldn't trade anything for my journey. Yeah, yeah. Because when I uh, look at the impact yeah. of the work I do now, yeah. I would have never been this powerful if I had not have gone through that part of my journey. Yeah. And so that's what I give. Hold on. You don't know what the impact is going to be on the other side of this. I think what's so big about that is you said you got to like get over the embarrassment, yeah. right? Because so many of us are stuck and there's so many people that are stuck right now in whatever situation they're in and they feel like I can't move. This is the biggest mountain. This is the biggest hurdle I've ever had in my life because they're so embarrassed because what will they say? Yes. What will they think? What will they think of me? Mm -hmm. If they knew what I was really going through. And that's the first, that's why when you ask, what's the first thing I had to do? I had to get over the embarrassment. Yeah. Because you will filter your decisions through trying to maintain a mask that nobody even cares that you're wearing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I had to get over myself. Yeah. Don't nobody yeah. care. Don't nobody care, Sherry. Yeah. And I mean that in the most loving way, meaning yeah. they out here living life. Yeah. They're not that concerned. And so hmm. when I got over the embarrassment, that's when I was able to really walk in my power. That's when I was able to show up. Oh, <laughs> I had a meeting one day and I didn't have enough money to pay for the parking. Mm -hmm. And I, but I still I was like, you know what, girl, you gonna park your car. You gonna show up as the bad boss that you are. Yeah. And I walked in that meeting and when I came back out, the, the you know how sometimes the handle girl the handle was up and the guy had went on lunch 
<laughs> you got to walk in. So yeah. the, what God yeah. taught me is, baby, don't ever let your external circumstance rob you of showing up in the wholeness of who you are. Hmm. Right. And so regardless, uh, and when I say to my clients, regardless of your financial reality, regardless of where you are in your marriage, regardless of the struggle that's going on with your children, the piece of that power that's within you, it's within you regardless of your external circumstances. And when you are a person who lives in the, I work with at professional athletes, corporate executives and entertainers. So they're always in some form of the limelight. When you live in that limelight, it's hard to understand what it feels like to know, okay, I've got to still show up, but my marriage is broken. I still got to show up, but I'm literally crying my, myself to sleep. I got to go out here and perform and play in the Super Bowl when I don't even know if I can hold my head up because yeah. of this internal pain. Yeah. Well, I learned that. I learned that because I had to keep showing up. You didn't know. Yeah. And you 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 showing yeah. up with me on a daily but I'm helping serve you at our lunches, yeah. right? Yeah. Not knowing that truth. That's what I have to be able to say to people is you can still show up. Everybody else nobody knows you're going through bankruptcy yeah. cuz you still got the external shine. I know and I'm helping you grow through that. Nobody knows that you literally don't feel like you can go out and perform. I know. How do we get you through that? And so that's the power that I got through that journey of really going through that brokenness yeah. because the truth of the matter is I left Sherry on that bathroom floor. Yeah. I got up. I am gutted and God use me however you want to use me. Now, Sherry, as we close out this interview, cause I can't believe this hour, you know, we didn't got, got to it. Okay. But as this we, is so much you didn't even know. I mean so much. This was like, <laughs> as much as I felt like, and I told the team on the, you know, we we're probably, I said, this is, I know Sherry. Yes. So I'm going to, this is going to be easy, breezy, peasy. You know, like I know her, this going to flow. We two sisters. And that's girls. what I thought we was going to talk about. And I know we were going we there. We was going, but, <laughs> but you know what? Because we're both open to yeah. what God is doing for both of us in this season. Yes. That God is just using us as a vessel. Yeah. And so the moment we get in front of these microphones, we have, we have a, a responsibility, mm -hmm. Right. Because we're on assignment. Oh, God, and speak we, through me. Yeah. And speak it's not my me. will, but thy will. Yeah. Right? All the time. You know, but I want you to really speak to our audience as we close out of this. Because for somebody who is listening, they're like, you know what? My finances is jacked. Baby, you don't even know the half. I'm out here studying. I got the Bentley truck I still got to pay for. I got this mortgage that I'm in over my head over. All the things that are happening. And there's an expectation for me to show up. I need you to give them something that they can run with as they go through the rest of their 2024. Mm. Well, the first thing I'll do, I'll preface it with this truth. Just because you have elite talent does not mean that you are equipped to deal with life's challenges. And so the first thing I would say is get help. Like I'm an advocate for coaching. I'm an advocate for coaching because coaching really helps. Now, everybody who calls himself a coach is not a coach. There's a lot of them out there, Sherry. <laughs> Everybody who calls himself a coach is not a coach. Yeah. A lot of people are just in between jobs, yeah. Yeah. okay? <laughs> just be real. Um, but whether it's therapy, whether it's coaching, um, whether it's a trusted friend that you know is mature enough to be a vision partner and an advocate for your wholeness, because, you know, I need you to get someone that you can be vulnerable enough to talk to. Yeah. That's the first advice I would give. The second advice is... Um, Allow yourself in your truth to really ask yourself, what do you want? That question is so elementary, but it's so powerful. But when you answer the question, really be honest with yourself, which is the hardest thing to do. Because so many people, when you look at, I'll just use some of my professional athletes, when I ask them, what do you want, right? They know they have their professional careers. They know they have that. But when I have them really answer the question, what do you want? Most of the time it comes back to peace. Mm. I want peace. They may go through the words freedom and we eventually get to peace. They may go through, I want healthy relationships with my family. Yeah. We got to get to peace. They may say that I want to get past my anxiety. But literally, and I've been doing this for a long time now, it always goes back to peace. And so what I would say is you have to understand that peace really is your power. 
peace really is that place where you get clarity. And when you put peace and clarity together, you always have the courage to do anything, let go of anything, transition in any area. So truly from my heart, peace is not a kumbaya. Peace is truly our power. And here's the most powerful thing. And it's possible. Most of the time, people, peace is not possible. You understand all these kids I got, all this trauma I'm going through, all this pain I've had? Peace is power. Peace is possible. And peace truly is the new success. Peace is the new success. Sherry Raleigh, it has been my honor. Sis. You are still, look, Super Friends Unite. This is yes. like the, the Super <laughs> Friends. This one, the, this the real link up. Y'all, yeah. it has been a pleasure. Thank you for Sherry Riley for being on the show. Thank you for sharing that peace is the new success. And so another one here at Vaught Empowers Talks. I thank y'all for joining me today. Be sure to hit that subscribe button before you leave so you don't miss your daily dose of inspiration and motivation. I'm your host, Brandy Harvey. Until next time, eat well, give a damn, move your body every day. Peace.